Okay, so in this talk, I want to address a very simple question, which is the question of knowledge. So uh, the question, what do you know, is one that we're familiar with in the school. That's what exams are for. Uh, but there's a subtle difference. I don't want to just ask questions and you give me answer. I want to open the box and read what's inside. So just like I can see the structure of the brain, the architecture, I would like to see and read the information that is stored with it. Okay. Now, there may be information that uh, your brain has that even you aren't aware of, right? Uh, and even if I ask you a question about it, you might not be able to answer it. So I'm sure that at some point or another, uh, all of you have been surprised by your own dreams, right? So, and whatever information you have learned, I would like to be able to transfer it. Right, so to, to move it somewhere else. So as a professor, I often find myself wishing that I could just download what I know onto my students. And when I say you here, I really mean a deep neural network. Of course, the brain is quite different, but in terms of information processing machine, many of the considerations apply. So why am I interested in this problem? Well, uh, more practically, just imagine that you have a number of deep neural networks that have been trained to solve specific tasks. So they have learned these tasks. So let's call them experts. Now you come with a new task, okay? And you would like to be able to transfer knowledge from things that you've learned before to the new task, okay? Each of these experts may be expert in one particular, uh, in one particular task. And for that particular task, it may have a certain performance. So how do you choose? Do you choose one that sounds similar, for instance, in terms of the labels? Or you choose one, do you choose one that performs well and then hope to be able to transfer, maybe if I have a fine tuning, uh, to your task? So how do you decide which one is closest in some sense? And how will you predict uh, whether or not it will work and how well it will work? And how long it will take and how much it will cost, right? Obviously, you want to do that without first trying all of them, right? That would uh, defeat the purpose. So you would like to be able to predict cost, time, and performance, okay? So how do we define and measure knowledge or information in a learning system and how do we access it and transfer it, okay? So now when you, uh, I don't have a good definition of knowledge, uh, but when you search for images with the tag knowledge, you get typically get a library, but uh, books contain data and it cannot just be a matter of memory, right? Because if you memorize a book and all you can do is recite it, then I wouldn't say that you have a lot of knowledge. I would say for the knowledge, if you manage to use whatever you learned to solve some task other than what's in the books. So in other words, uh, there is this notion of the information or knowledge, whatever it is, is measured by the impact or usefulness it has on something other than the data that contains it. Okay. Now, we don't train networks by giving them books to read, at least not yet. So we give them examples. In a sense, you know, we, we teach to the test, but even then, we don't ask them same questions. So we, we, we train them on a training set, for instance, uh, classifying cats and dogs in images, and we test them on a different test set, for instance, finding cats and dogs in a different images, right? Uh, in order to understand what the network learned. So even the simplest measure of usefulness pertain to generalization, okay? And if I am successful at generalization, then I would say I have information about cats and dogs or I have knowledge about cats and dogs. Okay, so what is information? How do we define it? How do we measure it? How do we transfer it? Well, uh, when we train a model or when we learn, we take data and then with this data, we optimize some type of fit using a parametric function, typically in this case, deep neural networks, right? And uh, once we're done with that process, okay, uh, we have extracted information from the data to the weights. What, what does it mean? Well. First of all, what is the learning task? Before we start training our model, and even during training, there's no other knowledge about the task that the network has other than the data set. So when I say a learning task, I mean a data set. After you're done training, okay, whatever information means or whatever knowledge means, it is in the weights, in the parameters of the trained model because there's nothing else left after training, okay? So the weights, or the model parameters are there, they're, they're physical. I can read them, I can read the registers of my computer. Now, we don't know the language they speak, so we don't know how to make meaning out of these weights. Uh, 
So instead, what we do today is we test the network again by running a test. So we take some data other than the one used for training. We predict the output and we measure the loss compared to ground truth in a held out data set, typically if we do that empirically. But then we know how well the network performs on that particular data set. But if we want to make a more general statement about what the network has learned, what the network knows, then we will want to be able to answer what is the test error for any data set, any future data set that I may encounter that I don't know. Okay. And so the way we do this today is using generalization bounds, which compare the test error, which is something that you would like to measure, but you cannot because you don't have all the test data that you will see in the future, as a function of the training error and something else that better be computable and finite. Right? And that's something I'm going to write it using notation from Shannon Mutual Information, and I'll explain later what this means. But this is the information that the weights contain about the data set. Okay. There are different bounds. Here's another one. This is the puck base bound that says that the test error, again, you would like to say that it is small, but you cannot evaluate it. But you can bound it by the training error, which obviously you, you, you measure and optimize, and by something that depends on the information that the weights contain about the data set. Okay. So first of all, it's reasonable that the quantity of the information in the weights would appear uh, because we talked about the fact that nothing else is, is left other than the weights after training. But if knowledge was only about memorization, then you would want to make this information term big. You would like to store as much information as possible. You would like to memorize. Right? But what these bounds say is that if you want to be able to use that information in the future, you want to make the test error small, which means that you want to reduce the information. You want to make the information in the weights as small as possible. And this is in, unintuitive, especially for those coming from information theory and communications, because here you literally want to throw away information. In fact, you want to throw away as much information as possible so long that this does not impact the training error. Obviously, you can make the information in the weights zero by just flooding them with noise or setting them to constants, but then I would not get a very good training error. So I want to minimize the information in the weights traded off by the training error. OK, so now I'm going to have to come back to the question, what is this mutual information between the weights and the data set? OK, so in communication, information is a property of a distribution of a random variable. OK, so Robert Fano once told the story of a group of us uh, gathered at the workshop that Wiener once walked to the office where he and fellow graduate students were working and stated that information is entropy and then left which left everybody puzzled. And so they had to go and figure it out. And the rest of the history of it, the rest of it is information theory history. But here, there are no random variables. We have one data set, D. And after we've done training, we have one set of weights, W. OK, so the data set is zero entropy. So the mutual information with the weights is also zero. OK, so if the weights contain zero information about the data set and the data set is the learning task, then what I have learned is zero. OK, so clearly this does not make sense. OK, now we could say, well, uh, yes, the, the, the learning task is a data set, but I could have picked infinitely many different data sets that still represent the same task, let's say finding cats and dogs in images. So we could treat the data set as a random variable of which we get one sample. And if we treat it as a random variable, then we could compute the mutual information with a weight. So we train a deep network with deterministic or stochastic gradient descent. But even if you uh, train it with stochastic gradient descent, once you fix the random seed, you get the weights which are a function of the data set and they are a deterministic function of the data set. And so if you compute the differential entropy, because these are not uh, discretized. Um, uh, they live in a continuum once you take the gradients. Uh, they uh, have infinite, uh, minus infinite differential entropy. And so uh, the mutual information is infinite. OK, so this quantity, the information that the weights contain about the data set, is either 0 or infinite, depending on how you think of the data set. But either way, 
uh, we get something nonsensical because uh, in one case we get that we have learned nothing and the other case we get that the test error is less than something which we control at plus infinity. So that's not very useful. Okay. So uh, where are we? Uh, first of all, uh, we have established that the learning task is a data set and information, whatever that means, however we define it, is in the weights of the train model. We have one set of weights and whatever information means, it's in there. Okay. Now, uh, in order for, you, for us to, to, to talk about knowledge, uh, we have to talk about usability or, or, or usefulness, and that uh, pertains to something else other than the data used for training. And even for the simplest case of generalization, that requires forgetting. So that's, you can read it from the bounds. And in the bounds, you can see that training uh, loss trades off uh, information. And I hope I convince you that uh, the standard notion of channel mutual information for the case of deep networks, which are once trained the deterministic input output maps is problematic. Okay. Uh, and so if you use it in the bounds, you get vacuous bounds. Okay. So now to be fair to Shannon, it is in theory possible to compute at least an approximate version of the Shannon mutual information. The way you would do it is you would uh, take uh, many data sets D and for each of them, you would train many different uh, models with parameters w, and you would get a posterior p of w, d, and d. Now you would take that, you would average over all possible data sets, you get the marginal p of w, which is the adapted prior. And then you compute the discrepancy between these two measured by the KL divergence. You average it over all possible data sets, you get a number, <clears throat> okay? So uh, now, does this number make sense? Is it meaningful? Does it tell you something about your ability to acquire knowledge? Okay. Uh, I contend it doesn't, and I'll give you an example for that. So, by the way, the way we measure how, how meaningful it is, is we would plug that approximation, that number, into the Pac Bayes bound, and we see whether that correlates with the test errors, right? So, <clears throat> if this goes up or down, we expect the test error to go up or down. So the experiment you can do is you can imagine you have a data set and uh, you train a network and you get a bunch of weights. Mm -hmm. Now, typically you have many more weights than data points. This is, uh, the models are overparameterized, And so what you can do is you can append to each weight vector a datum. For instance, you take an image, you string it as a vector, you append it after the least significant bit of the first weight. You do the same for the second, the third, all the way to uh, your entire data set. So by doing that, you have stored the entire training set in the weights of the model, okay, beyond the least significant bit. Do you expect that this model will work better because it has more information? Okay. Uh, not really because the model is not able to use that information. It, it's not accessible to the model yet the amount of information in the weights has increased. The Shannon information in the weights has increased, okay? But, but the test error hasn't changed, okay? So I'm going to propose a way of measuring information that relates to the ability to generalize, okay? Which we established that Shannon, even if you could compute it, which is a challenge, uh, doesn't, okay? So now, uh, again, uh, we go back to Shannon, it's just a different way of computing information which relates more to ray distortion theory. It's an idea that he used to measure the entropy of the English language. So you take a sentence, okay, and if you want to know how much information that sentence contains, you can perturb it or add noise and see if you can still reconstruct it, right? If you perturb it a lot and you can still reconstruct the sentence, that means that those characters that compose the sentence don't contain a lot of information you could have compressed them heavily, right? But if a sentence, the moment you, you start making some changes, all of a sudden you incur errors in the reconstruction, then you know that that contains a lot of information, right? So in the case of communication, you take the data, you add noise to the data, and then you try to reconstruct the data. So the task is the data, right? For us, it's different. And so we're gonna to have to adapt this, uh, this uh, approach. And one thing that we need for learning that is not present here 
is that in our case, the amount of noise that you can add, first of all, it depends on the task. Uh, and the task is not to reconstruct the data. But also, it depends on the level of performance that we want in the task. Okay, so let me give you an example. So let's say that your task is to classify images between uh, airplanes and cartoon characters. Okay. How much noise can you add before you are unable to separate planes from cartoon characters? Well, it depends on how well you want me to do it. Because if you're okay with 50% accuracy or 50% correct answers, then I don't need any information. I will just flip a coin and get half of them right. And so I, I, the information is zero. But if you want me to do it with 75% correct, then maybe I'll just do a simple color histogram. And if there's blue, then there's airplane. And if not, it's cartoon characters. And even if I perturb the data a little bit, I'm not going to make any more errors, right? But if you now say, well, no, I want 99% correct, okay? Now, all of a sudden, oh, by the way, I can perturb the, the, the data or I can perturb the model. These are equivalent, at least for uh, models that are linear in the parameters. But if you now want me to have 99% correct, then I'm going to have to use a much more complex model. And as soon as I start perturbing that model, I'm going to pay a price, okay? So uh, how do we instantiate this idea? Well, we are going to do it by hypothetically adding noise. Of course, in practice, we don't just add noise. And here's how we do it. So take a data set, train a model, however you want. Okay, it doesn't matter if it's done deterministically, stochastically, and so on and so forth. You get a set of, set of parameters W0. This will be your weights of the trained network. It's one set of weights, not a random variable, one fixed set of weights. Then you would add noise to these weights according to a distribution which you choose, let's say, for instance, Gaussian, okay, until the training loss exceed a certain threshold. Okay? So you take the biggest possible uh, error, or you minimize minus the entropy, until the expected loss drops below a threshold. Okay? So you're looking for the maximum amount of noise you can add without damaging the training loss. Okay. Now that is the information that is not accessible. Okay. If you can add noise and nothing changes means that the data that you corrupted is not informative, right? So that is the uh, uh, non-accessible information and whatever is left is the accessible information. So there will be some constant, okay? And uh, whatever that constant minus the inaccessible information is the accessible information. And that's how we define it. Okay. Let you pause for a second to think about that. Okay. So basically, there will be a constant that doesn't depend on the noise we add. And then we add as much noise as possible. Okay. Until we hit a, uh, we pay a price in terms of training loss. And the amount of noise we add is the, is the access information or the, the um, inaccessible information and whatever is left is the accessible information. Okay. Now, in practice, we don't go and add noise to the weights. So if you look at this optimization problem and approximate it to the second order, uh, you get that <clears throat> for the Gaussian case, uh, the information is actually proportional to the log determinant of the Fisher information matrix. So at least for the second order approximation, you get back something which is uh, well known. More in general, however, uh, you can frame this uh, uh, constraint optimization problem using a Lagrangian, okay? And so what you have is uh, you minimize the training loss and at the same time you minimize the information in the weights with respect to the distribution of the noise, okay? So this is the optimization problem you have to solve in order to compute the information in the weights, okay? Now, the interesting thing here is that <clears throat> The definition of information in the weights subtends a variational principle because you need to minimize, to optimize this functional in order to compute the information in the weights. And how does this relate to generalization? Because we said, well, we want to say that you have learned something if you're able to use whatever function of the data you computed to generalize, to reduce the test error. Well, it turns out that this quantity which we need to compute accessible information is actually 
what is inside the pack base bound. And so the pack base bound inside has the Lagrangia, which means that if you are able to not only make the training error small, but also make the information in the weights small, then you're guaranteed generalization. If you make this as small as possible, then you have the lower possible, uh, the smallest possible generalization bound. Okay. And one thing to notice is that uh, if you think of this as a regularizer, then uh, the mechanism for regularization here is not to reduce the dimensionality of the space or the number of parameters, but reduce the information they contain. In fact, computationally, it's beneficial to let the number of parameters be huge, but just reduce information by adding noise, by perturbing them. Okay, so just to summarize what is new up to this point is that we now know we have an information, a definition of information that measures uh, the amount, uh, the maximum perturbations that you could apply to the weights without paying a price in terms of training cost. This notion is well defined even for deterministic models that are trained on a single data set. Uh, the definition of information subtends an inductive principle, which is the information Lagrangian, minimizing which allows you to acquire information. And in the second order approximation, this relates to the Fisher and is computable for networks uh, that are real world networks with uh, millions, tens of millions, uh, hundreds of millions of parameters. And the resulting generalization bounds are not vacuous. Okay. And by the way, uh, this same framework and same mechanism for computing and same variational principle can be arrived at in a completely different way using language from Kolmogorov complexity and Kolmogorov structure function. Okay. So now that we know how to measure information, we can actually measure it at each weight, at each parameter, or the average over a layer, or the average over the network. And in this case, I'm showing the average over the network as we train the network. We could literally see where is the information going as we train the network. So uh, in theory, what you could expect could be that as you start learning that you accrue more and more information. And maybe at some point, you know, you get diminishing return and at some point you, you get an asymptote. And from that point on, you don't learn anything. But in fact, what you observe is quite different. It's the blue curve, which is that at the beginning, you accumulate a lot of information, you memorize a lot. And then at some point, you start forgetting, literally, you throw away information. Okay, this is what information theorists uh, uh, suggest that you don't do. And as you are throwing away information, the performance in the test set, which is the one in green here, keeps increasing. Okay. So this phenomenon actually is, is quite uh, uh, stable across different data set, different tasks, different architecture, different training methods, and so on and so forth. Now you may ask, well, if you know that this network eventually will only need 100 nuts of information to encode your model, then why don't we just limit the dimensionality to however many, many weights we need and forget about this big bump? Well, the problem is that if you mess with this transient, then you never get to the point where 100 nuts are sufficient to learn the task. Okay, so in fact, this is quite well documented in biology and now also in uh, artificial networks. I will not get into the details, but if you're interested, you can find them in the paper. Basically, if you uh, perform a deficit, if you, if you apply a deficit to the data, for instance, you perturb the data by adding noise or by blurring them, so that you reduce the amount of information in the initial transient, then you never converge to a good minimum. So and you're familiar with this. If, uh, if a child is born without, uh, with myopia and if you don't correct it soon enough, the child will never learn uh, how to see normally, no matter how much time they are afforded. This is why you cannot teach a dog new tricks and old dog new tricks and so on and so forth. So what I want to show here is I want to have you look at the information as we are learning. And so what you see on the left is a normal network here is learning. Uh, in this case, it's a ResNet 18, uh, a seven layer network on uh, uh, CIFAR 10. What you observe is that most of the information is concentrated on the middle layer, layer two, three, and four, right? Uh, but if you apply the deficit by blurring the images, what you observe is that, <clears throat> first of all, there's a lot more information that's been stored and it's stored in the last layer. So in other words, the network is transparent to the data and just tries to memorize the data and recall it at test time, at um, when computing the, the error. 
But what you observe is that if you remove the deficit and now switch to training with normal images, not blurry images, then the information redistributes because information goes from some layers to other layers. You can see that these curves cross. So we call this phenomenon information plasticity. It has nothing to do with uh, physical plasticity. The connectivity of a deep network is fixed, but the information reorganizes itself, moves from one layer to another in order to, to minimize the um, uh, information Lagrangian. Okay, now you say, why, why do you say minimize the information Lagrangian? Because when I train a network, I only minimize the training error. I don't have that additional information in the weights term. But in reality, you do. And you can see it both empirically and you can also um, uh, show it analytically. So if you want to see it empirically, think about the fact that this information plot here, uh, the second order approximation is the Fisher information, which is the local curvature around the, of the lost landscape around the path. And so the fact that there is this bump means that you're going through regions of very high curvature. You can think of these as bottlenecks. And after you manage to cross the bottleneck, then you, the, the landscape opens into these wide valleys or wide minima where a fissure is uh, low, so curvature is low and, and uh, information is low. So because of the way we train network with stochastic gradient descent, there is a bias towards finding these wide valleys. Then what happens is that even though explicitly you don't have a penalty for the information in the weights, in practice you are minimizing the fissure and therefore the information in the weights. Okay. And you can show it also in terms of energy. Okay, that and SGD has an inductive bias, where even though technically speaking the loss function is just the, the, the empirical cross entropy, that there is a an imputed uh, regularization term there. Okay, so now that we know these things, what can we do with it? So how is it useful in any way? Well, so right now we can measure the information in a deep network. We can see how much information a particular weight contains, a particular uh, layer contains, and so on and so forth. We can control information. We know that we can just add noise and destroy information, which is beneficial so long as it doesn't affect the loss. Okay, and we can we know we can acquire information by minimizing the information Lagrangian. We can also visualize the information. We can plot it literally over time. So the question then is, well, how do we take that information that is stored in these weights and transfer it somewhere else? Okay. So. In order to transfer information from one task to another, uh, we need to understand how different tasks are related. Okay, so a learning task is a data set. And so if we want to talk about the relations between data set, we need to determine what space they live in, because I could have a data set with a certain number of images uh, of a certain dimension, and then I have a different data set for the same task, different number of images, different size of images. How do I compare them? Right. So we need a topology in the space of task, at least a distance, so we can compute how far they are. Uh, ideally, we'd even compute you know, geodesics and paths and whatnot, but at least a distance. So uh, we did this back in 2019. We proposed the first topology in the space of learning tasks. And the way we did it is we defined an asymmetric distance. You will say, <clears throat> see in a second why asymmetric, where you compute the amount of information necessary to learn a task, D1, say finding cats and dogs. And then you compute the information you need to jointly learn D1 and another data set D2. Okay, for instance, finding cats and dogs and sailboats. Okay. The additional information you need to learn the new task after having learned the first one is the asymmetric distance between task one and task two. It's asymmetric because if you learn a very complex task and then want to solve a simpler task that maybe even is a subset, then the distance could be zero. But if you go, go the other way around, where you first learn a simple task and then try to solve a more complex one, they may be a, a large cost, a large distance. So uh, here's an example where you take a bunch of different tasks from classifying uh, handwritten digit to classifying small images to fashion to artificial data sets and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and what you see is that this confusion matrix, which measures the asymmetric distance, is asymmetric. So it's uh, it, the distance between for the distance in going from a complex task to a simple one is small the distance going from a simple task to a complex one is large how do we actually compute do we actually train on one task and then train on the other task uh, you know by the time i've done that i've trained on the second task uh, the the point of computing a distance is good if i because it's predictive of how it is 
how easy it is to transfer information is useful also only if I know if I know how to compute it without actually transferring information before transferring information. So the way we do it, and this is an idea that uh, we published in 2019 called task to vec is to use a generic probe network, which is just a neural network with sufficient capacity to get decent error in most data sets, and then train it on uh, and then training can look at the Fisher information of this, which is a, lives in a linear space, okay? And then you use the Fisher information as an embedding for the data set, for the task, okay? And if you do, do that, then you can compute uh, distances between thousands of tasks. In this case, for instance, if you take uh, subtasks of a naturalist, you actually retrieve uh, the taxonomy of species. And then you can also cluster in the space. And if you cluster, you see that the cluster sort of makes sense. But more importantly, this is predictive of uh, your ability to transfer information from one task to another by fine tuning. And so here's back to the motivating example that I gave at the beginning. So you have a bunch of different uh, tasks, different training set, different models trained for these tasks or experts. And now you come in with a new task. So obviously you don't want to fine tune on every single one of these models and then decide which one is best. So using task to vec with a Fisher embedding, you can determine without actually running the experiment, which one is the closest model. You can predict the generalization error you will achieve and how much time it will take for you to achieve that error. Okay, this is a paper to predict training time. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on, especially in the initial phases of training that I alluded to before. And so uh, I mentioned critical periods where, you know, if you train with blurry images and then switch to normal images, not only you're not helping them training normal images, but you're actually hurting because you'll never get back the performance you would get if you ignore the initial transit. So there are some irreversible behaviors uh, of the learning dynamics and critical periods are one example. And so critical periods are an example where you know that two tasks, even if two tasks are closed, for instance, classifying CIFAR images slightly blurred and classify normal CIFAR images, they're very close. Same hypothesis space, very similar statistics. Yet, if you pre-train on one, you cannot fine tune successfully on the other. Okay, so we know that there are tasks that are nearby, okay, yet you cannot fine tune from one to the other. So the notion of task distance is not enough to understand generalization, understand transfer learning and moving information from one task to another. So there is another notion, which is the notion of task reachability. And this task is a bit busy, but roughly speaking, this is what I'm trying to get to here. <clears throat> and this is work that Alessandro Achille did with coworkers back in 2018. So it doesn't just matter whether two tasks are closed. It matters whether you can actually find a path from one to the other. The image I showed earlier was from the movie Fitzcarraldo, where the protagonist um, wants to go from one river to a nearby river in the Amazon. Uh, to get to the opera house in Manaus in time for the inauguration. And, but there's a mountain in between, so I wanted to take the, the boat up the mountain, and that caused all sorts of disasters. So just like that, we can, not easily and with approximations, compute the probability of our sample paths from any weight W0 to any weight WF. And that probability of sample path uh, has two factors. One is the exponential of the information gap, or the Lagrangian gap, where the information Lagrange we defined before between the two tasks. So that's kind of the energetic term that tells me how far the two tasks are. But then there is another factor, this integral, that ideally would be one, but in practice, in some cases, it's not. And so that measures the task reachability, not just whether two tasks are closed, but whether you can, there is a likely path from one to the other. Okay, so hopefully I've given you uh, some flavor at least of some new concepts that were introduced and these are not abstract concepts they are computable so one is that uh, the definition of information okay uh, and uh, the fact that we can transfer information uh, and we can see information during transfer and information moves around it's a concept of information plasticity and the fact that it's possible to measure how far two tasks are and whether it's likely that it will be able to transfer information from one to the other. That's the notion of task topology and task to vec. But also whether there is a likely path between two tasks, even though they are similar. And that's the notion of task reachability. Now, these ideas, as I said, uh, 
are not uh, abstract, so they correspond to real quantities that you can compute. With data you have, it doesn't require you to assume that there are random variables where you only have samples from it. Okay, and so uh, there's obviously a lot that, uh, more detail than what I can cover in this uh, presentation, but uh, everything I've said is general in the sense that I don't say what the task is, whether supervised, unsupervised, unsupervised, so this, the, the ideas are quite general. We have done the, the calculations and the code and the proofs for classification. It would be nice next to look at uh, uh, closed loop operation and continual learning, lifelong learning, where we don't separate between a training phase and, a, and an inference phase. There's a lot to be understood about the early phases of training, which are decisive to eventual performance. So it would be nice to be able to say early on whether a training campaign will succeed. But also, once you pass the bottleneck and you are in the, in the flat valley, things get very simple to the point where, if you are careful, you can even linearize this network in a way that requires a whole other talk to discuss, but in a way that is just as good as if you were uh, doing full nonlinear fine tuning, but you can do that by solving a linear quadratic optimization problem. And that opens the door to uh, many more variants of learning where you don't just optimize the learning loss, the training loss, but you also optimize other criteria or constraints that may come, for instance, from security, privacy, fairness, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot that is now possible uh, in real, real world networks, not in toy cases, uh, for expanding the scope beyond just trying to achieve the smallest possible generalization error. Uh, I leave some references here and feel free to reach me or Alessandro Achille, who is my co-conspirator in many of these ideas and certainly the principal engine behind the execution uh, offline at uh, via email. Thank you.